Hello, this is Gary Marr of Glenville Community College. This screen capture is for my SAS 150AB online students. In this screen capture, we're going to discuss topics, concepts, and vocabulary from Module 2 in our Canvas shell. First order of business is that if anybody has any questions for Module 1 or Week 1, please make sure you ask me those questions in a Canvas email, or you can also join me for my virtual office hour on late Wednesday morning or Thursday afternoon. If this was a non-COVID year, I'd be in my office several times in the course of a week to meet with students to help them with different questions and problems they're having with the material. Since this is a COVID year, we have to do this virtually. So I sent you guys over the weekend uh, meeting invitations to my office hours on Wednesday and Thursday. These are not required events for you to attend. Uh, I had to send you the invite so you could access Zoom. But if you have a question and you'd like to get some clarification on it, you can always connect during those times via Zoom. You may not be the only one I'm working with, so I may put you in a meeting room temporarily, but I can help all you guys then, just like I would hopefully in my office. So that's another source of getting help with some of the material. There's also virtual tutors that we can set you up with where someone can actually connect with Zoom, like I would during my office hour, and help you with questions you're having with the assignment. And then finally this week, I will probably, and again, I'm not sure if you get an email from Microsoft, but Microsoft will get a list of all the students in this class to enroll them in the Azure Imagine program, which GCC subscribes to. This gives you access to a bunch of Microsoft software for educational purposes, which means you have to learn, use it for learning and not turn around and create the next best Facebook with it. That, and they have to register if you're going to take that approach. But um, I, can't, I can't remember if they get, give you an email indicating that you're now registered or if I get the email but there's instructions that are in Canvas already on how to access this information once you're set up you're not set up yet so don't try to get access yet unless you have had access in a previous semester then you may still have access but this is something we'll be working with in the next couple of weeks you have two assignments that involve flowcharts and Azure has a program called Microsoft Visio which is excellent for creating flowcharts and much easier um, way to create flowcharts than using Excel or PowerPoint. And um, it's really infinitely easier. But also what I've done is there's another program that's available on the Internet, not from Microsoft. It's called Draw.io, which pr basically provides the same sort of function in terms of drag and drop a bunch of symbols together with some text to create flowcharts. And um, we do flowcharts for a couple assignments, two and three. It's not a dominant learning element of this class, but we have to cover it. And I don't want you spending a lot of time trying to draw flowcharts when products like Draw.io and Visio make it much, much easier. So we'll be dealing with that over the next couple of weeks also. The first module has a lot of information on development methodologies and how to put together a solution to a problem or an opportunity. Section two of the textbook starts to get in the nuts and bolts of things. We start to actually create logic statements, which would be those sequence of steps necessary to solve a problem or take advantage of an opportunity. So what I have first here is a slide called identifiers that give us two of the nuts and bolts, or maybe a nail and a screw. One is called a variable. One is called a constant. Now, a variable, by definition, is something that changes. So this identifier can have a value placed in it and that value can change. Constant, by definition, doesn't change. So once something's put in a constant, you can't change it with your logic. Now, when I say change it, uh, a variable name, in this case the word answer, is pointing to a memory location in your computer. Fortunately, we do not have to memorize memory locations, which are usually hexadecimal numbers. Just like when we use the internet, we don't have to remember IP addresses. We can use domain names. So what I'm doing in my logic is creating a placeholder for data that I'm classifying as answer. Now, this data will be a zero, so it'll be a numeric data type. But I can also have text in these variables that would be a text or string data type. Uh, data typing or describing what kind of information is held inside the identifier is important. How important depends on the programming language. We're not actually creating program code here. We're just creating the recipes or the blueprints necessary to give to a programmer to create the code. 
So most of the time I will stay away from using, uh, as part of the lecture, techniques specific to a programming language unless it's so pervasive it's going to appear in all programming languages. For example, the equals sign here is the assignment operator. The variable is called answer, and the um, zero here is what's called numeric literal. It means it's just the value of a number. The way this is going to work is the assignment operator is going to take whatever's on the right side of the equals and stick it into the identifier on the left-hand side, or that variable called answer. So now answer is holding in memory a value of zero. This statement is going to take answer, add 100 to it, and then give it back to the memory with a new value. So now answer is going to hold in memory the value 100 or 0 plus 100. And then finally what I'm going to do down here is simply just change that value to 77, forgetting these previous steps. This is some examples of some of the things we will do with variables. In the case of a constant, we're going to give the constant a name, we're going to set its value, and then we're going to use that constant in calculations, but we're never going to try to change it. Okay, It's supposed to remain the same throughout, like the value of pi never changes. Now, also associated with uh, variables and constants, which are going to be in other slides or later slides, are data types and naming conventions. Let's talk about naming conventions first. You want to be consistent in how you name your variables and your constants. Variables can use Pascal casing, where it's uppercase letters for every part of the variable name if it's multiple words, uppercase S, uppercase T. You could have lowercase. You could have mixed case, where it's lowercase S but uppercase T for the second word. This is also called camel casing. This is what I use. Visually, it's much easier to see that there's two words in this variable versus sales tax, which is all lowercase here. And if there's a third part of this, then the start of the third part of the variable name would also be capitalized, representing humps on a camel. There's also snake casing, where you have a dash or underscore in between the two words, or shish kebab casing, where there's a dash. But I would stay away from shish kebab casing, because that can be a problem for some programming languages. Now, constants, typically the standard for that is to make the name all capitals. And unfortunately, I violated my own standard here by making a mixed case. But you'll see on a slide coming up here in two, I'll show right here, that tax happens to be a constant in this example, and it is all uppercase. So if you do use all uppercase, you want to make sure it's going to be used for a constant. And the computer won't care, by the way. You can do whatever you want. But it's kind of like this. It's a programming standard. It's an industry standard. It's a professional standard. When you go to get lunch, you can take your car down the right side of the road, which is legal. Or since the left side is paved, could you not take your car down the left side of the road? Yes. You'd probably get an accident because people drive on the right side of the road. So what you're doing is you're following an industry standard, which says in this country you drive on the right side of the road. So... When you name your constants, you want to make sure you use all capital letters because that's the programming standard for working with constants. And again, um, you'll see another slide coming up. This variable simply is a nickname that points to a location in memory. And whenever that nickname is used in our logic, it's going to pull that value out of memory and do whatever. Calculate it, move it, combine it. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff you'll see as we get into some of these examples deeper in class. Now, this is a question on the test. There's different um, actions you can perform on variables and also constants, although constants has one less. Variables do all three of these. Constants cannot be reassigned, so this isn't available in a constant, but you can define a variable, give it a name, and a data type. Some languages, let's just say int total. That's all you have to supply. It means that Okay, I need to reserve some space in memory that's going to hold the integer total or a number. You also should, if the language, some languages require, sometimes you have to initialize the variable when you define it. So it's not good enough to say total or int total. You're supposed to have int total equals and then some value, which is um, going to be consistent with the data type. If it's an int, an integer, then it would be zero. 
if it was a string data type or text data type of some sort, it would be double quotes, indicating empty string. Referencing variables and, and constants is simply the act of including their names inside some statement, if you will. Print total. Uh, total equals total plus 100. Those are referencing that already declared and defined memory location called total, the variable total. And then finally, the assignment is changing the value in memory. You saw that with the first slide, or the previous slide, when I talked about answer, getting different values assigned to it. Uh, you can't reassign constants. You initialize a constant, but you can't change its value after it's set. <clears throat> now, here's a slide on constant. And the only thing that's it's an interesting scenario about constants is that uh, pi is definitely constant. Pi never going to change. They try to get that decimal to repeat, and they can't. But a lot of times you use a constant for something which doesn't change often, like sales tax. Um, here's an expression here that says total cost equals sales, what you bought, times 0.055%. That would give you the total cost of that sales tax. If it's $100, it's 5 bucks. is what total cost would be. Um, but I could do it differently, too. I could have set up the percentage sales tax as uppercase tax, a constant that has a value of 0.05, and then in my calculation, use the word tax instead of the 0.05. The benefit to this is, will sales tax always be 0.05? Chances it won't be. It might be 0.055 next month or next year. If it is the case, if that's the case, all I have to do is change my initial initialization of the variable here to be 0 0.055. And because I refer to that constant value with its name, I don't have to change this. This happened a lot with the Y2K problem. People had hard-coded dates instead of having date variables and date constants. So you had to do these searches to try to find evidence. Like if we had just used 0 0.5 and this was a you know a large retail store, how many places are they going to calculate sales tax? Oh, gosh, all over the place. So we'd have to find every reference to 0 0.05 and change it to 0 0.055. Whereas if we had used the magic bullet constant, we'd have to change it in one place, and that would ripple across all of the, the statements in logic that actually use that value in a calculation. So that's the one kind of exception to constant. Um, you it, 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 it does change, but not often. And if you do it, the way this sales tax was implemented down below here. It's a much more efficient and much more quality, less chance for defects solution than hard coding the value in the statement. Um, I've talked about this already, but this is, a, I guess, a pictorial of what's going on with a variable. In my logic, I have a statement that uses a variable called total. And what does it do? It points to something in my computer's memory. And at that location is a value. I'll set it, then I'll return it, I may change it again, and then when I turn the computer off, it disappears. Or when the program ends, it disappears. Because this is a memory location, it's not a disk location. This location would be different. Keywords versus identifiers. Keywords or reserved words, and all languages have these, um, are reserved for that particular programming language. Since we're not running our logic, it's not a big deal that our pseudocode or that logic we create, the steps, has a reserved word. They will find, especially in some of the Python examples, there's some words I cannot use as an identifier. Either as a variable or a constant. Print, for example. Print is a Python keyword. Most languages have print as a keyword. They have if, they have while, sub. There's a bunch of keywords which are typically found in most computer languages. I cannot name an identifier with that name because that's reserved by the programming language to perform some sort of operation. And again, this is more just FYI type stuff. We'll see this in action as we start developing logic models and then convert them into Python code or programming code. I use Python in this class because it's probably the easiest language to learn and it does give you exposure to a programming language, but it's not a required element that you learn how to program in Python. We have a class for that, and that meets on uh, Monday mornings. <laughs> also associated with 
identifiers is data typing. And again, this is more of a, I guess, a programming topic than it is logic, pure logic. Because pure logic basically says we have numbers, we have letters. But some of the programming languages, there's more definition, especially when it comes to numbers. Uh, Python is like pseudocode, doesn't care so much. But Java might have five or six different ways to express a number. Byte, short, long, float. And the only difference between the way it expresses that number isn't some, I guess, isn't much the expression the way it's stored. What happens is a byte is one byte of memory, whereas short may be four bytes of memory, a long may be eight bytes of memory. Well, back in the bad old days, when computer memory wasn't as prevalent, if you knew that the value that you were storing was never going to be greater than 100, then you probably would use a byte data type instead of a long, which could be in the gazillions, because you're wasting memory that will be set aside with your identifier that will never be used. Uh, this is less of a problem now because memory is cheap and plentiful. So a lot of times your scripting languages won't care about um, data typing. But typically your compile languages where they're creating uh, very tight, very fast executing uh, machine code solutions will care about data types and have something called primitive data types. And you'll see this if you take Java or C Sharp. Expressions. Okay, we take another step forward. Expression is when we take and combine identifiers with operators to come up with statements to perform some sort of task. Uh, these could be assignments where we're using an equal sign to store something, or they could be a calculation. So in your, um, I believe it's third assignment, you do a calculation. In your second assignment, you're just doing a, you're doing assignments, and then the third one is calculations. Um, Usually, most of the, well, in in both cases, you're probably going to see the assignment operator, but then in calculations, you're also going to see your arithmetic operators, which is your plus, your minus, your multiplication, your slash for division. All of these are frequently found. Uh, and everything from cell phones to calculators. So this shouldn't be too much of a problem for you folks. Back in the bad old days, it was typically something we had to spend more time on. Um, also with operators, we have something called operator precedence. Now what operator precedence means is that all operators are the same. Some are evaluated earlier than others. And this can really kind of follow you up. This is what introduces something called a logic error. Whereas the programmer, you forget that the multiplication is a higher precedence than the addition. And so when you put together your programming or calculation statement, you didn't take that into consideration. Here's an example of this. If the variable a, b, and c have values of 2, 5, and 6, a plus p is b times c is what? Well, since multiplication is a higher operator precedence than um, addition, B times C is done first, and then A is added on later at the end. And what this will do is it will change your answer, as you will see, and give you the wrong answer if you don't follow operator precedence. At this point, I think we need to start to look at some of the logic examples that might reinforce what we've talked about so far with identifiers and um, expressions. So what I've done here is in the very first example called identifiers ex.txt. This is simply a text file that I have put in pseudocode an example of variables and a calculation. Now, all pseudocode is is a text representation that starts from the top, goes to the bottom, reads left to right, much like a recipe would. The different instructions and the order in which they should be executed. Pseudocode should always start with the word start and always end with end. Pseudocode can't be executed. All this is is a model, a recipe, or a plan that I would give to a programmer to implement in Python, which is what I've done here below, excuse me, done below. So for this particular example, the first thing I do is I create a variable called total sales using camel casing, and I define its initial value to be zero. The double slash in this example here is a comment symbol. Now all combat symbols do is they provide additional documentation in English that if you're using pseudocode will hopefully take and give you more English-like explanation 
what is happening. So what I did on this particular comment, I said, this is a total sales value variable. On the second statement, since it's all capitalized, it's a constant. It's going to hold the value of GCC. And here I initialize as GCC, and I should probably also add as constant. So I have two identifiers here. One is a variable, one is a constant. Okay. Down below here, I am going to do a uh, expression, a calculation, which says my total sales value will be equal to total sales which is 0 plus 100. So now the value of total sales is 100. And then finally, I want to print total sales. So I would see 600 on my screen. I did not use the constant in this particular logic. I could have. I might say, if I wanted to modify this to use that, I might say print. Okay, and I would put a maybe a string literal. My college is... Okay, and then I would add to that the text value college so that what would print out on my screen is my college is GCC and then I would see total sales as being 600. If I was going to create a Python program that would implement this particular pseudocode, it would look something like this. And the point here is I don't want to spend a lot of time explaining Python. But hopefully what you're seeing here is that this is very similar to pseudocode is very similar to Python. In fact, the one change I would make here, I just copied it without thinking about the comment symbol. Python uses the pound sign or hash symbol as the comment symbol. Double slash is used by Java, JavaScript, C sharp. But Python uses a pound. So rather than have a double slash there, I should have a pound sign. But here I'm going to initialize my variable is zero. I initialize my constant, do my calculation, and then I'm going to print. And print in Python happens to be a function, so it's got some parentheses around it, but essentially it does the same thing as what I described up there. Um, you're going to be doing a lot of pseudocode. Uh, and pseudocode, again, is just that recipe that's going to have all the logic statements in it to define exactly what you want this program to do. And then you're going to hand that to the programmer, or you're going to program it in a class like C Sharp or Java or Python, and implement that logic into a running program. So, let's go to the next statements. Some of the errors you're likely to run into in the development process are syntax errors, logic errors, and runtime errors. Okay. Now, you're going to see these as I work with Python. You're not going to run into them and run into them at all when you're working with pseudocode because pseudocode cannot be executed. I could make a typo here that would be fine for pseudocode, although I would spot it to say you've got a typo. But if I was to make that zero down here, well, let's implement this statement down here first. Let's implement this in Python. Print my college is I make it a lowercase O instead of an uppercase O. When Python ran this example, okay, it would error because it doesn't know this word college. It's not defined in my program. It knows it only is capitalized. This would be a syntax error. When I forgot to put the college in there as part of my program, obviously the pseudocode doesn't care. This might not care either. At least it will run. But the person who had requested this program to be written is going to say, wait a minute, what's going on here? How come it's not listening to college? Well, that's a logic error because what happened there was the program didn't programmer did not create the appropriate logic in their pseudocode. So the programmer missed it in his programming code. And that's an error, because the correct solution should have had the college listed as part of the answer. The final kind of error, which is um, a little bit ahead of us at this point, is what's called a runtime error. And this would be caused by mixing data types that weren't compatible. So, for example, if down here, again, you're not going to see this kind of an error in pseudocode, because pseudocode can be executed. But, for example, if I had passed my pseudocode to the programmer like this, 
So they were looking at not the number 600, but the letters 600. When it came to calculation, a calculation can be made with a number, but it can be made with letters. What are the letters 600? What does that equate to? Who knows? So this would have to be a number. And if it did have the quotes around it so that it was the text value 600, it would fail with a runtime error. Okay. So you'll be asked what the three kinds of errors you can run into when creating programming logic. And there's syntax error, logic errors, and runtime errors. When it comes to pseudocode and flowcharts, they cannot be executed. So they will not have a problem with it. But the programmer who implements your logic plans would have a problem with it. We'll also work, not so much now, but later in class, with a tool called a debugger. And back in the day when uh, I think she was a Rear Admiral Grace Hopper was working on the first computers in the lab prior to World War II or during World War II, they had these huge computers that threw a lot of heat and had what's called vacuum tubes. And because the vacuum tubes were a relatively new technology, they would fail a lot. And since this was a research project, they had a lab book. Every time one of these tubes failed, they would document it so they could get back to Motorola or GE or whoever made that tube with information so they could make a better tube, one that would last. Well, one morning they came in and the computer was down once again. And they found that one of the tubes had burned out. And it burned out because a gypsy moth had gotten into the building and was attracted to the light of the tube and shorted out the tube. So they pasted the lab book, and you can Google this, that there was a bug in the system. Well, it was a bug, and that's where this whole term started about having bugs in computer. The act of removing bugs is called debugging. There's actually, uh, as part of a lot of programming environments, something called a debugger, which helps you find specifically using runtime and logic errors. Debuggers... Um, do not find syntax errors. In fact, if there's syntax errors, it'll stop the debugger call and say, I can't continue. But it will as you let you walk through your logic. It lets you walk through that logic and see what the program is doing. And you can usually tell from that walkthrough where your program took the wrong turn and where the bug is located so you can fix it. And that's also addressed in that chapter. All right, so a lot of stuff thrown at you this week. There'll be some more videos coming out on some examples, and we'll continue to build on what we know here uh, as we continue with more PowerPoints next week. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, stop by the virtual office hour if that would help too. Thank you.